start with our next talk, how to defend cars. And therefore, it's an honor to introduce uh, the two following speakers. First, it is Alexios Likides. He is a security researcher and research associate at the security group of the techno of technology. He's PhD in applied mathematics and computer science. Additionally, oh, yeah. you found um, um, Gu Guillaume <laughs> Dupont, <laughs> Guillaume, yes. uh, and um, he is a PhD candidate in inter inf automotive security uh, focused on IDS in, in vehicle networks. So give them a warm applause and a warm welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Hi from us as well. Um, we are here today to present our, our top, the topic that we are working on for the last couple of uh, months. So, um, yeah. first of it all, I will start okay. it doesn't uh, by giving an introduction about ourselves. So, uh, as for me, I am a senior researcher at Security Matters. Uh, uh, Security Matters does network security. They specialize on networking and detecting threats and uh, malfunctions of the uh, software or hardware. So uh, I'm also a lecturer in the TUE. Uh, it's here in Eindhoven. So I did uh, my uh, PhD, as it was mentioned, on uh, applied mathematics and model-based design. So I'm also focused on performance evaluation and network monitoring. And this is Guillaume standing nearby me. He's uh, now doing his uh, PhD also in the TUE. His um, research areas uh, are basically automotive security and uh, also intrusion detection. So how to actually defend cars, which is our main topic for today. So, um, no. No. Uh, so I will start uh, giving um, some introduction to the how to enter in the in-vehicle environment, uh, which is actually what we call uh, car to x communication. Then I will continue the presentation by giving some insight what could be done uh, if you really uh, go inside it, uh, how are the protocols working, and what actually are the vulnerabilities in this sense. And then Guillaume will uh, continue on how to develop an ideas and then we will focus on our ongoing work and presenting you some things about actually what we are currently busy on doing. So, um, first of all, um, uh, let's have, let's say, uh, a very basic view on what happens uh, in the in vehicle com X vehicle communication, which means actually the V2X as we call it. So V2X means actually that any car can communicate it to any entity which is actually in the network. This is like a wireless communication, which means actually that on the one hand you can have cars, or you can have satellites, you can have uh, road stations that you talk to, you can have, um, uh, let's say, access points or also backend devices which are servers and manage your uh, data and manage also uh, the fact that actually when something is spotted uh, in the car or in the neighbor's car, then actually this is sent to all over the network and you can see traffic, you can see, as we will see later, other entities. So. Um, the important thing to, to note here is that actually the concept is still ongoing. So um, the, the protocols that are already there, they provide you this kind of communication that you're able to um, uh, use wireless or an extension to Wi-Fi um, in order to be able to connect to actually uh, a single LAN network. And then from there, you can uh, be able to send data to your neighbors. So what we have in wireless sensor network is the notion of neighborhood, um, which means actually that, uh, let's say, take, for instance, this car, it will have a range all over the place. And in this range, it can actually either unicast to find actually what are the other cars and what data it needs to send to, or, or even road stations, as we see here by these flags. So um, these are roadside units. The roadside units are responsible for maintaining actually the traffic, maintaining each entity which is connected on the, uh, on the network. 
and then actually you can uh, uh, be able through this communication to uh, be uh, aware actually of uh, conditions on the road. So, for instance, if you have to slow down, what happens actually uh, if you uh, slow down automatically? Um, it's a concept that actually is uh, under uh, working. So now what you can see actually on the GPS is that it can tell you, okay, uh, you have uh, traffic, so please slow down. But what happens actually if this context becomes more generic, which means actually when we have autonomous uh, vehicles and then actually they can break down automatically by giving an indication on the network un units. So um, to be um, honest with you, um, um, the, as I said before, uh, the technologies that are there actually are uh, not really so extensive. So uh, some of them are, are being worked on uh, and uh, some of them actually are still ongoing. So we have uh, uh, the, let's say, uh, uh, let's say an extension of the Wi-Fi, as I said before, which is for short range. This is actually uh, the next one, the standard that is worked on. So the 5G communication, which is an extended range communication. You have also cellular networks. What happens actually if a pedestrian has his smartphone and he needs to communicate to, uh, let's say, the car or some interfaces? And this kind of communication has to be managed in such a way that you have actually uh, automotive overtaking. You can have actually col collaborative driving. You can actually see through vehicles uh, visually. And you can um, uh, find users that actually do not violate the conditions or do not respect them. So um, how does this happen? So here I give you a demonstration actually of your own vehicle, how all these entities and modules communicate between each other, and then uh, actually how the communication is happening with other vehicles on the one hand, and also with the roadside units on the other hand. So this means actually that you send information and you get information from the roadside unit, and then this roadside unit can also interact with other vehicles which are not in your neighborhood as uh, the concept actually of wireless sensor networks. And then what you can also do is that you can uh, do uh, collaborative perception and you can send the data actually to some backend server which will do that for you. And then actually it can, um, it can not only uh, inform the neighborhood but also the whole range of cars and the whole city or area, what you want to uh, call it. So. Um, what are the requirements, of, though, for this kind of communication? One of the important requirements that we have to consider here is that the latency. So what happens, actually, if I have a wireless network and I put it in the car, and actually the car needs some information, and it doesn't get it because of packet loss, because of packet, actually, collisions, or whatever. So um, the reliability also is one important thing. Uh, if you have, uh, if you actually go to the context of Internet of Things, what they try to do is that you have web services where you have clients and servers, and you actually have this context here. So how reliable is this context? It's not, because once actually you put it to the wireless, um, yeah, so you, you know actually what the problems are. So what I would like to also focus is the, the density of the traffic. So the density means uh, when cars are really uh, connected to each other and they are platooning. So what happens then? Uh, a requirement here is actually that you uh, can collaborate within each other. If they are not there, you can't. So um, what happens if actually I have a car and the car actually sends the position in a GPS and the position is not accurate enough. What will happen then? So I, I, I see actually something in the road, and the position that I send is not accurate. So all those things actually impact the communication. What happens if the data rate is not correct, or I, I lose the bandwidth, or uh, let's say the ITS station, the, uh, the roadside units uh, loses the bandwidth. So all these requirements come to the fact that actually, on top of that, we have also the security issues. So these are PFAS and information here. So we have to consider actually that you as an entity um, or as a person, 
you send some information over the network, and then actually this, ne this network can be listened to by everyone. So the data actually becomes not confidential any longer. And in this case, actually, there are a lot of uh, permissions that you need to give. So uh, for this reason, you have this kind of privacy issues. And the privacy issues that here do not really um, apply perfectly because actually if you have a unit that is not behaving very well or it sends some wrong information or some malicious even information, then actually the whole network is uh, out of uh, sync and then all the cars do whatever they like. So in this case, what is really important here is that we consider the fact of a firewall. So to go to the firewall issue, uh, the firewall actually allows you to only get the messages that you really have to. So in this case, you can use them. But this is like an application level. What happens actually if I have a car and the car really needs to be protected uh, internally and not only on the application level? What happens if I say every time, OK, I need to up update my firmware, uh, every time actually I have new rules for the antivirus or the firewall? So, so I have to get an over-the-air update. What happens if the over-the-air update is exposed? So in this kind of situations, OK, what network security gives you is a fast uh, detection mechanism. You see all the data that is coming to the network, and then actually you can uh, reason upon them. And then also what happens to the network accessibility. So for instance, um, there is an attacker or an adversary, and then actually he blocks the network accessibility. How you detect such kind of threat? The, the application level will not tell you anything. So um, to give you, uh, let's say, one concrete example is when you actually abuse this kind of concept of collaborative communication. Uh, here on this side, you can see actually uh, cars that uh, inform the car that is in front of an icy road. But what happens actually if I am an attacker, an adversary here, and I just connect to the network? I mean, so I break the network and I connect it, or it's like an open network. and I send false information, and he actually has to break and stop actually all the other cars from moving and uh, make a traffic jam out of nowhere. So what happens also if I have a denial of service? So I just start sending messages, and everybody can receive it. So this kind of situation, like a, a black hole attack, where actually all the messages that are sent are put somewhere else, or actually I, I stop the network from uh, being accessible, and then all the messages that I send are dropped. So this kind of communication, um, and also, of course, uh, the RSU, the roadside unit, is important here, because if you have roadside units and control, so they are responsible for, uh, for being able to maintain this communication. What happens if they are not? So. To give you a more realistic scenario, uh, what you see here on the one side is actually a practical example of this kind of attack. So uh, Milan and Valasek, they uh, uh, started by exploring actually different cars. And in the end, they managed to actually get inside uh, some of them. And also what they could be able to do is that to disable them entirely. So actually, you are driving on the road, and then actually the, the Jeep stops, and you are uh, in the middle of nowhere, or even you hit someone. So uh, how dangerous could that be to the passenger and also to everyone else? So um, and here you can see also that what the CIA does is that they actually find some leaks in the cars in order to be able to make you uh, aware in the first place, but you don't have this kind of information, but also remotely control your vehicle if you do something bad or if you uh, or what if they make mistake and they stop your vehicle or they access your vehicle and you are unable to do anything? So the two questions that we need to answer here is that how can we able to, uh, as an entity for me, to detect uh, an attack before it's happened? And also, what can I do uh, with this detection? So how useful can it be while I'm driving and I see on the screen, on the GPS screen, for instance, all the telematics screen? I see, OK, uh, you've been hacked. How will I respond to this? So these kind of questions 
are really important if you consider the fact of the attack scenarios that can happen and also the interfaces and the, uh, and the ways that you can access the vehicle. So what we call surfaces here is the different interfaces like the, uh, the pressure management system, which actually can be accessible wireless, and also from Bluetooth. What happens if I have, let's say, a key, and the key actually is hacked, and it's not working correctly? What happens if, uh, for instance, I plug a, a USB or a, a malicious uh, drive uh, in general, and, for instance, I can send uh, messages to whatever entity I want in the car? And also, what is the most critical issue here is also what happens if I gain remote access to the diagnostic port of the car? and then I can send diagnostic messages to the car, get all the information, and then stop everything from working. So um, another example, as, he, as we focus actually on the telematics unit, is to have a malware. So here you have actually what, uh, uh, what you see actually is the screen of a car, and then here the files are decrypted, and then you get some kind of information that you have to pay a lot of money to decrypt all those files, and you have certain time to pay it. So what happens if I have a ransomware, well, as we say it? And in this sense, uh, I would like to focus on the in-vehicle communication. So what happens actually when I'm in the car? So how can I defend the car, or I can know what happens when I'm inside? So in this figure, you see actually all the systems that communicate to the car. You have uh, control area network, which is the basic one, and uh, it's used to uh, all the vehicles that we know nowadays. It's a stable interface, a serial interface, and uh, a lean, which is used for controlling the keys, for controlling the windows. And also, you can see here that CAN is responsible for the engine, is responsible for the br braking, also FlexRay, new protocols. Um, they are responsible for suspension in the car. So what happens if I get inside one of these interfaces and I start getting, sending commands to the vehicle? So in this sense, um, the, uh, the way to get in, what may mostly all the people do, is that I can go to the central gateway. The gateway can be accessed by uh, vehicle-to-x communication. So you can actually gain access to this if it's not properly, and it's not properly, um, uh, it's not confidential, it's not properly secured. So what happens if I go inside the gateway and I actually say, OK, I want to gain access to the engine. So OK, I want to uh, gain access to the braking system. And then actually I stop them by sending messages that are exactly the same as actually uh, I w the car would expect them to, and I be, I'm able to control it. So in this sense, we have these four protocols, and also now we have the concept of automotive Ethernet that communicate between each other in order to be able to um, control the different functionalities of the car. And its protocol is actually uh, uh, giving a different functionality. As we see here the, uh, in this example, uh, yeah, so in this example, we have the safety related ECUs. So this means that there are ECUs inside the car that are actually. Uh, providing safety to the uh, passengers that are there and others that actually is not so critical to, to defend against them or to secure them. So if you go into de more detail, uh, more deeper in detail, uh, in this sense, uh, as I mentioned before, this is the overview of all the uh, actual uh, mechanisms and protocols that are used in the car. And of course, all these uh, protocols, they connect to each other uh, in a really manufacturer-specific architecture. So you have, let's say, CAN, uh, FlexRay, as I said before, and MOST, which is responsible for the telematics, for seeing videos, for the GPS, and also automotive Ethernet is under development for infotainment and also safety, and FlexRay, which is actually for more luxury, let's say, cars. So. In this sense, um, as I mentioned before, what is the most simplest thing to do is that you can actually focus on a protocol that is used by the integrity of the cars, like CAN. Every, I think, let's say, for the people that do not know CAN, I just put 
slide here to just introduce it to you. So um, CAN is like a serial communication protocol that actually sends data over a broadcast bus, which means actually that all the uh, controllers or the ECUs, or how we call it, everyone that is on the bus can listen to this data. And what they can also do is that they can also receive it and then try to reverse engineer it and understand what they are. So if you compromise something inside this communication, then you have to know that actually everything else is compromised. So, um, so in this sense, what happens is that CAN uses the, this arbitration mechanism in order to control how the messages are transferred over the bus, which means uh, messages are also defining priority. So priority means, actually, uh, if I want to do denial of service, I can send a high priority, um, let's say, frame onto the bus, and then I can block it from working. So it's that simple. So um, in this sense, uh, here you can see, actually, the frame, which tells you, actually, uh, in this sense, uh, that you have only eight data bytes in order to uh, put your information there. So there is no encryption, nothing that you can be done in this sense. So in this case, um, what are the vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, is that you lack of uh, a scheme to address uh, actually the different stations. You lack of um, encryption, of authentication. And of course, what I, uh, I just say here is that there is no authentication between the different ECUs. Each ECU can, uh, let's say, encode an ID, and it can send it over the bus. Nobody else actually will know that it is this ID, uh, this ECU, or that ECU. So it will just know that this information I just need to interpret. So it's really easy to spoof. So the main message that I want to make here is that security is important in this sense, but how you do security? You can use keys to authenticate. You can use, actually, cryptography. But of course, all these things, you have to know that uh, you are targeting some let's say, proprietary system that is manufacturer-specific, and it's also resource-constrained. So all the ECUs are embedded. So they have microcontrollers, which are really small in capabilities, in terms of, um, in terms of power, in terms of uh, processing. And how can you keep all these devices up to date? So you, can you do secure over-the-air updates? You can't, most of the times. So in order to move forward, we actually, uh, with Guillaume, uh, which is standing by my side, we uh, thought of another solution, how to be able to actually protect uh, this kind of environment on distance by just, let's say, focusing on the network itself. So I give now the word to Guillaume, and we will continue later as well. Thank you, Alexio. Yeah. So like Alexio just discussed, we really need some strong security in our in-vehicle network. So there have been some papers or research conducted in order to come up with some solutions. So for instance, we often hear about ECU identification with certificates, or how can we use MAC, message authentication code, in order to make sure that the message that we receive on ECU is coming from the right uh, peer. Most of the time, the problem is uh, related to the underlying uh, protocol specification of the um, car network um, protocol that we are using. So like Alexio just discussed, the very short data size, uh, 8 bytes, um, doesn't give us much room to add uh, security features. So for instance, adding a Mac in order to identify the message doesn't work, unfortunately. There are also some researchers who try to segregate networks or at least sub-networks within the car just to make sure that avoiding, let's say, a non-critical uh, ECU residing on a non-critical uh, sub-network wouldn't be able to send or forward message to a more highly critical uh, one. There are also some ideas um, proposed in order to embed on chip a trusted platform module. The problem, again, like Alexio mentioned, uh, the, uh, every ECUs on cars are very, uh, let's say, resource constrained and limited. So everything that we used to do, or that we are actually currently doing in a desktop IT, I is unfortunately not um, translatable or one-to-one -one mapping in the automotive world. So I recently read about an article about um, descri describing cars being like the new Windows XP. So doing automotive security is a little bit like uh, looking at security back in the 80s. 
So we have to reinvent ourselves, basically, from scratch uh, with very unsecured protocol. Our research uh, is actually looking at IDS. So how do we come up with intrusion detection system solution that we could uh, embed in cars? It looks very promising, especially when it comes to, let's say, a more general security uh, measure. Network monitoring is one of the key, um, let's say, a key technology that you should have in your network. Being in control means first knowing what exactly is happening on your network. So, first of all, there are some constraints and technical challenges that we will have to overcome in order to develop such a security measure. So, first of all, hardware. Like we just discussed, uh, ECUs, so the little uh, microcontrollers that are communicating on the car network, are very uh, limited in terms of uh, resources. There is also a real-time constraint. So, basically, when you ride your car and you want to brake, you start pushing the pedal. You want your car to start braking right away. You, we cannot have any delay in terms of um, a s a message sent and received. There is also another problem when it comes to the physical location of your car. Sometimes, let's say you're going to pass through a tunnel, or you're going to maybe go abroad, or let's say in a country, or in an area where there is poor signal reception. How do we make sure that your security measure doesn't rely on, an, uh, let's say, um, constant internet connection, because you might be actually sometimes in so-called blind zones. Another problem will be the life cycle of the car. So usually when you buy a car, a new car right out of uh, the manufacturer, we could con uh, consider that it will last for a period of time from 15 to maybe 20 years. How do you make sure that you, the security measure that you will implement will last over such a long time? Especially when it comes to cryptography. We know that usually, like after some years, crypto gets broken. So how do we make sure that we embed security measures that we can securely also update along with the coming new technologies? And also the compatibility constraints. So how do we make sure that the solution we can deploy for one car will be also um, portable or compatible with other manufacturer or other model? And one thing that we tend to see in the manufacturing or in the auto manufacturing industry is every model is based, let's say, on a new architecture. Even if you take the, the same model, car model, if they produce a new one some years after, the chances are they will have some modification already in the architecture, which makes it really difficult to have a generic enough solution that we can deploy um, regardless of the brand or the model of the car. So. IDS 101. So for those of you that are not really familiar with intrusion detection system, let's uh, set up some uh, definitions here. So first of all, according to NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, they de define intrusion de detection as the process of monitoring the events occurring in a computer system and analyzing them for sign of possible incidents. So if we would translate this definition to our automotive uh, context, basically IDS for cars would be monitoring the events occurring on the car network and analyzing them for incidents. So incident in our situation will be any event that we uh, identify that could lead to a compromise of the CIA, confidentiality, ident um, sorry, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the car data. So in that sense, basically an IDS is simply the software or the hardware product automating this process. There are two main ways to look at IDS. So basically, when it comes to the response, you can either have a very passive approach, which means the IDS uh, will detect an alert and passively will simply notify um, or send a notification, let's say, to uh, the system administrator or in our situation in the car to the user. Doesn't take any action. And on the other hand, you also have a more active approach in which basically you detect an, uh, an event which uh, is flagged as malicious and then you will take uh, actions. So an action that could be taken, for instance, would be um, terminating the communication, for instance, or reconfiguring uh, some uh, network uh, security device, for instance, um, automatically, um, automatically changing a firewall rule, for instance. So basically, these two approaches lead to, to intrusion detection system versus intrusion, intrusion prevention system. Um, in our context, we will use a little bit uh, loosely these two terms, and according to the literature, we agree that we can shorten that by saying simply IDPS, Intrusion Detection and Prevention Systems. So, 
one key question that we also have to take into account is how do we measure and how do we assess the efficiency of an IDS? So according to Porras and Valdez in the 98, they proposed three metrics. So the accuracy, the performance, and the completeness. When it comes to the accuracy, there are three main values that we look at. The false positive, the false negative, and the true uh, po uh, negative, true positive, sorry. So basically, if the system sees an, uh, sees an event, which is malicious and flag it as a malicious. This is a true positive. It correctly identifies a malicious event. On the other hand, if it for didn't recognize an, a malicious event and let it through, it's a false negative. What we want, uh, what we want to avoid is flagging as malicious a non-malicious event, which call that a false positive. What happens if you have a high rate of uh, false positive? You're gonna be swamped with a uh, false alert that you would eventually have to react on. But every, every time you're going to spend time to react on, an, uh, on a false positive, which basically leads you to waste, on uh, waste of time, and eventually at some point you will not rely uh, on the system and say, yeah, well, it's just false alert all the time. I don't care anymore. So the idea here, we need to have a true positive rate. Performance, it's all about also how does the uh, IDS is successful at processing in real time uh, the events and the, the, the packets coming on the network. And another metric, the completeness, quite hard to assess, but it's all about how capable uh, is the IDS in detecting every attack. So when it comes into the context of in-vehicle uh, IDS, it first has been introduced by Hope and Al in a paper entitled Security Threats to Automotive CAN Networks back in 2008. So here, the, the purpose, they identify that it's all about monitoring the data transmitted between ECUs and be able to assert the legitimacy. So they also identify three different characteristics um, that in order to detect intrusion detection. So they come up with some patterns. So first of all, it would be recognizing the increased frequency of CAN messages, being able to observe low-level communication characteristic, and finally, identify the misuse of messages IDS. So like Alexio mentioned earlier, uh, can the, the automotive networks are very deterministic. So if you just look at uh, what's happening on the network, it's very easy, according to the CAN specification, to know when is to, uh, who is talking when. So any deviation from this kind of specification will be normally easy to uh, detect and also will be um, leading to a direct uh, incident. So. We, uh, part of our work, we were looking at how could we define an IDS taxonomy for in-vehicle networks. So we based our work from Debar and Al. So in, back in 2000, they proposed a revised taxonomy for IDS, in which they proposed different category in order to uh, distinguish IDSs. So first of all, we can, we can look at the different detection method. So in a nutshell, you have two main classes of a de detection method namely knowledge or behavior based. We will come to this uh, notion uh, in a minute. Then you can also look at the behavior on detection, like we just discussed. You find something, what do you do? You react passively or actively. Then you also have the audit source location. Where do you put your IDS? Are you, there is like ma mainly two ways. Either you look at the host or you look at the network. We will come to these uh, two different characteristics in a minute as well. And finally, usage frequency. Do you want continuous real-time monitoring? Preferably, yes. Or you could also look at periodic monitoring, basically what your antivirus is doing. Every day, hopefully, or every morning, you boot up, uh, you turn on your laptop, and then it will run a check. It's just checking once a day for, let's say, um, signs of intrusion on a snapshot of your system. Periodic monitoring. And finally, you can also look at the detection paradigm, state versus transition base, a bit out of topic for today. So we came up with this uh, decomposition of uh, in-vehicle IDS. So we were looking at different detection techniques. So first of all, you have knowledge base and then behavior base. In between, if you combine these two approach, you can have what we call an hybrid IDS. And then you also have subtypes of behavior base, namely behavior specification base, flow base, payload base, we will discuss about the characteristic of this in a minute. So first of all, when it comes to the audit source location, like we just mentioned, we can either look at the host, so deploying an IDS at the host, or at the network. So they both have their uh, drawbacks and advantages. 
but in a nutshell, so bas basically, the host based IDS will collect information and monitor the events occurring within the host. It is a monitoring. In, uh, in order to do that, it will analyze system logs, file accesses, modification. And he knows at any given time exactly what kind of activities are going on on the host. So mainly the advantages will be cap being capable of de uh, detecting events on the host itself and to also be able to handle encrypted traffic. Because when it comes to network, when you look at the network, if you have point-to-point -point encryption, usually there is no way to be able to, to know what's uh, happening in encrypted packets. But if you look at the host, right after the, description, the, de the decryption, eventually you can know exactly what, what is happening. The limitation to that, it is actually hard to manage. Let's say it's nice if you have only 10 ECUs or 10 hosts to manage. You put the EDS on the 10 of them. But when it comes to updates or modification, if you have configuration file to change. If you have 10, it's fine. But what about if you have 1,000? You have a problem of, uh, of scale here. And another problem, it is uh, blind to network attacks. And we are missing the, the overall context, which is not the case for the network-based IDS, in which uh, here we are monitoring the network. So here we are looking for packets, like tr uh, tr just traffic flows. And, and here the ID, we will be able to detect network-specific attack also denial of service attack, for instance, and we don't have any impact on uh, the host itself. We don't, uh, you, let's say, burden the ECUs with extra processing. On the other hand, we can, uh, we can only identify an attack, meaning we see the attack uh, p uh, passing, but we have no clue if the attack was successful or not. And if successful, we have no clue what was the damage, which hopefully normally, if well configured, the host IDS will know. So here, knowledge-based ideas. So this is the most straightforward way to address intrusion detection. Here the idea would be to define what or how look like an attack. So if you look at every attack available in the wild, and if you, let's say, create pattern of this attack, you put that in a database, and for every single event or packet that you see, you're going to try to find a match in this database. If there is a match, you know this is a true positive, there is an attack going on. So if you have a well-defined database, perfect. If you are capable of having a database containing every attack available in the wild, you're golden. Because you know that with such IDS, the great thing is that there is a very high rate of true positive. On the other hand, it's very easy to bypass or to evade. Um, there is no way, of course, that such an IDS can be aware of the latest all day, for instance. And plus, it's so easy to evade. Like today, you have like very uh, easy tools to you can encrypt an, or an already known attack. You just bypass it. It's same with antivirus. So another problem that we have to keep in mind is that if you would take such an approach, you will have to update it very recurrently. So basically, every day or even shorter than that. Problem is with an, uh, with a laptop or a computer server it works fine. We are basically connected all the time. But with a car. If you remember the constraint we just mentioned earlier, how do you do that if you are not uh, connected online? So in the, um, in the literature, we have uh, seen a, a proposal for such a system. Matsumoto and his team proposed a way to uh, prevent the transmission on of unauthorized uh, data. So here, as you can see, the fact that they, they are also capable of prevent. So this is where we call it intrusion prevention system, to go back to the, the introduction on ideas. And here the idea is they will modify an ECU to make sure that every packet coming to the ECU, so a few step backs, if you remember what Alexio mentioned about uh, the way ECUs communicate together, everything is broadcasted, so every ECU is received, every message is sent. So the idea here, since there is no addressing, you only have an ID, uh, of the message sent by the NSU. If you are monitoring what's coming to you, and if you see that the, you receive a message with an ID that normally you are the only one to produce, you know that there are someone trying to spoof or to send message and pretending to be you. So as soon as it detects that, it will send an error frame, which basically uh, s uh, send a message to everyone on the, on the bus saying, guys, there is an error. Don't take into, co into consideration this packet. So this was knowledge base. But then, like we said, it's really hard you know, to, come to, to have a way or to come up with solutions in order to detect, let's say, the unforeseen attack, like the famous O days, for instance. So this is where here in this approach, we're going to first look at 
the behavior of the host that we would like um, to, to, to defend, the host or the network. So here the idea is to first create a model. So you're going to start, let's say, within a certain period of time, monitoring the network and trying to learn what is the normal behavior for that network. So you see, for instance, this ECU talking with this one. You see, for instance, 10 packets uh, coming back and forth within, let's say, this period of time and so on. You create a model. As soon as you have such a model, you start just monitoring. And everything which will be outside of this model, so any anomalies, um, will, uh, will be flagged as an incident. So basically, if you know that, for instance, two ECUs are communicating every two seconds by sending back and forth two packets, if you start seeing 20 packets within, let's say, well, less than one second, you know there is something going wrong because it is not according to the model, the normal behavior model that you just um, build. Great to detect a known attack because basically with such a technique, you don't really need to know exactly how an attack is made of or what are the, the signals or the pattern to detect such an, uh, such an attack. As long as you start seeing something different, which usually is an incident, you raise an alert. The problem, problem is, in cars, it's very difficult to um, be able uh, to lower the risk of, of false positive. What happens? Every driver is different. You drive your car in a certain way, so packets are sent in a certain way. Then the next person driving your car, the, m the model will be totally, uh, um, let's say, faulty and will raise a lot of false positive. We have um, s sorry, some, um, some papers as well proposed uh, in order to come up with a behavior-based um, intrusion detection system here, placed on the every IDS, and basically here the idea is first to look at the transmission rate of specific packets. And every uh, any ECUs which detect a rate which is not according to the model it, it has first created will raise an alert. And then when it comes to the network base, so we have uh, two researchers who propose an approach looking on the entropy of uh, the, um, the packet. So basically here the ID, if you know, for instance, if you compute the, the, um, the entropy according to the different identifier that you see on your network, so you know there is a certain number of uh, different identifier on the network, if you start doing a packet injection attack, what usually will happen is that you increase uh, uh, at, uh, ver uh, very drastically the rate of the message that you want to send. And therefore, if you have a certain entropy, uh, let's say the more random, the higher the entropy, which means if you uh, start inserting or injecting more packets, it will be less random, more packets from the same number, you will have a drop in the entropy in red. This is an attack. And like we mentioned, we can also combine the forces of the, the two approaches. So this is exactly what Charlie Miller and uh, Chris Velasek did when they proposed an hybrid IDS. So they l looked at the, the, the attack and they said, hey, look, there is only two ways to make an attack. Either you use diagnostic messages, which normally I only use in the garage, or you send messages, standard messages, with just a higher rate. So they came up with this device that you plug directly in the OBD2 port, and basically as knowledge-based, they look for diagnostic messages, behavior-based, they learn for a few seconds what is the normal communication pattern, what is the normal behavior, and then any deviation will be flagged as an intrusion. And then you also have, um, in order to counter the problem of, like we just mentioned, behavior base, in which you can have a lot of false positive, because let's say every user is driving in a different way, you could also come up with a behavior specification base. So here the idea is, you don't create the, the model based on what is normal according to what you see, or you don't even use machine learning, machine learning techniques to build the, the model. You're first going to look at the specification of the protocol. What is the, the protocol or what is the, the packet supposed to do according to the specification? And the good idea, for instance, ex that's exactly what Mutter and Al pr propose. You come up with some sensors looking at, for instance, in S4, the range. So here the idea, if you know that, for instance, a car according to the specification, can only ride, let's say, from zero to, let's say, 200 kilometers uh, an hour. If you start seeing packets with 500 or bogus uh, values, you know there is something going wrong, according to the specification, and not according to uh, what you previously seen. So this approach has, theoretically, um, the same advantage of behavior base, building a model, but with the same detection rate of knowledge base, which is um, pretty high. Then comes another question, like my Alexio mentioned at the beginning, how do we react? You are driving, then an alert pops up on the dashboard, warning, 
you are under attack. What do you do? So here, some uh, researchers propose, let's say, uh, three uh, different uh, approach. So depending on the criticality of the attack, if it's, let's say, non-critical, an attack aiming at, let's say, turning on and off your light, not really critical, you just have a visual, like little light blank blinking. But let's say if you have something uh, aiming to, for instance, uh, kill your engine, will be very, let's say, critical and life-threatening, you would have an haptic notification, meaning, for instance, yeah, something vibrating or even like with the case, for instance, of uh, ABS. For instance, you could also have your car shut off. But again, how do we react on, the, um, on this without endangering the life of the passengers? Because this is exactly what we are looking for. So limitation of the ideas that we uh, uh, already uh, have seen in the literature is only focus on CAN. There is nothing focused or looking at other protocols. So therefore, according also to the limitation of CAN, um, there is still a lot of work to be done. Again, question, how do we react? Not very straightforward. And also, it's very hard to come up with metrics, meaning that when you look at ideas for desktop IT, usually you have, let's say, a, a test benchmark, or you also have like certain data set that you could use. You have, for instance, a famous data set for, of the DARPA, and basically researchers, when they propose a new approach, they test the system with such a data set. And they know, OK, I've been detecting 98%. So this gives you know, quite some straightforward result that you can rely on and say, OK, this is a good one or not. So finally, we would like also to discuss about the, going wor the ongoing work that we are currently uh, working on. So maybe, Alex, you want to uh, say some words? So, uh, can I have? OK, great. <laughs> so, um, so we are currently working, as I said before, in a project that actually is uh, founded by Bosch and, uh, uh, and Eclipse and, um, and Ericsson as well. So uh, the project is about um, uh, securing uh, cars, but also um, on the other aspect of uh, developing an open platform that is able to um, interconnect different vehicles, but also to focus on in-vehicle communication. So here are all the partners of the collaboration. Uh, we are here, as you can see, and here. So um, the, the fact uh, here is that actually we don't focus only on developing ideas but we, or, or security in general, but we focus uh, on developing an ecosystem that is able to be transparent for every vehicle and be used in open source for, uh, from everyone. And, uh, and the platforms on the cloud can be also uh, part of this equation. So, um, so in this sense, um, what is uh, important actually to, to deal uh, with and in this kind of research, let's say, uh, study, is first to focus on the practical side. How do you be, uh, are able to detect a threat or a misconfiguration and you distinguish between them? So how actually I'm able to, to say I, that, I don't, I don't know, Volkswagen put this thing in the car and the, the car is malfunctioning, not because it's a threat, it's just because actually it's not calibrated correctly. So another thing is that, of course, how do you um, recognize a threat in this kind of manufacturer-specific context, where actually each manufacturer can do whatever he likes inside the payload. Uh, they can encode whatever they like inside the, uh, the priorities uh, mechanism. So what we would like to do is to build a database of the known threats and the malfunctions and how to uh, ass assess them and be able to actually um, not only defend, but also be able to uh, make something robust and maintainable. So what we would like to make actually here is, uh, as I said before, a device that is able to detect all those things and have actually some kind of commands or, or an API. And also, this is one thing that uh, Security Matters does. They do industrial uh, intrusion detection. They have uh, uh, ITL systems in order to be able to assess threads. Uh, and also, if the thread is in a PLC or whatever, then you have actually uh, immediate detection and response so, uh, to an alert. So what we would like to do is this device that tells us actually how severe is the threat? How likely is that this threat actually really happened? How this functionality will affect the whole architecture? So the, the idea here is that when we start seeing uh, I IDS is too constrained, we just expand the focus and we really make something ro robust and sustainable. So here, 
uh, the focus is, of course, that we would like to uh, focus on the other uh, vehicle protocols. So what happens actually if I don't take CAN? I, I, I just say, OK, CAN is protected enough. And I want to focus actually on the other um, on the other ways that they can enter the vehicle. Because this is the thing that, as I explained before, uh, all the other protocols are the ones actually that are used to get inside. So what you can do when you're inside, you can do whatever you like in order to defend it. But as soon as you enter, you block it there. So it doesn't go any further. So this is actually what we, uh, what we focus on. And, and what we see actually is that all the uh, different kinds of protocols, they have master-oriented solution. So this means that if the master actually is compromised, then you are able to shut down all the other ECUs, nothing is working in the system, and you don't care about CAN anymore. So you just don't uh, have uh, active safety, you don't have suspension. So, yeah. So this is the my major question to answer here. And uh, I think uh, what actually is the main challenge of this work. And of course, here uh, we just demonstrated, let's say, uh, a small uh, subset of the work. We didn't go too deep into details. We gave a literature overview and a state, actually, of the communication. But uh, if you like to, and if I th I'm sure you will, um, you can, uh, I mean, we have this let's say, length of 10 minutes, I guess. I don't know how much it is it for questions and answers. And if you want to, you can also reach us because we are also in the camp. So this is from us, and we would like to hear from you. Yep, thank you very much. Yeah. A big thanks uh, for this talk. For every uh, Q&A, please go to the microphones that we can record it also for the streams. Uh, so the first person here in front of me. Yeah. To what extent do you think this fits into a security by design approach? Um, to be honest, actually, if you are, are securing the system by design, it does work in different Ethernet-based protocols. But in, in vehicle, it's not really flexible in the sense that you don't apply AutoSAR. So AutoSAR is a high-level methodology that you are on the application level, and you can specify requirements and security by design. But in this sense, most of the times, you, uh, you do trial and error in the cars. So you try actually to get the signal uh, decoded. And if it works with the current voltage, it works. So uh, you don't give the requirements on the design. You give the requirements on the fly, especially for security. Yeah, so this is a bolt-on approach. Yeah, yeah. But I think also when it comes to IDS, what we just discussed earlier is that it's one way to address security. So like you mentioned, security by design is not about just having, let's say, a silver bullet. Let's say we put an IDS and we are all safe. No, it's one of the layer of, out of many that we need to apply to cars in order mm -hmm. to secure them. Indeed, indeed. indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the second. Uh, so about the reaction, um, <laughs> I mean, if, if you detect something, what do you think will happen? Will there be this pop-up and the user is <laughs> supposed to do something now? Or what would you do in a car? So would you like to answer? Yeah, I, okay, I can answer. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a good question. <laughs> and I think here we have different approaches. So what, what you have seen in the literature is that First of all, we often see we raise an alert. People don't really think about, OK, but concretely, tell me, what does that mean, raising an alert? So we see like the case of, OK, we maybe blink a light, like we just discussed, or there is some also some, some sound notification. Wh what do we do? There is also a way that we can think about having cars connected uh, to a SOC, for instance, a security operation center. What if, upon detection, you have first the alert sent to a SOC you know, for uh, further analysis? But if it's life-threatening, you know, you need to react also real time. So you cannot just expect an analyst to pick up the, let's say, the, the, the ticket or the, uh, the alarm and say, OK, I'm going to look to that. Uh, give me 10, 15 minute, minutes. That doesn't work. So I think here, this is still a question uh, that we have to answer and that we really have to put some uh, good thought about it, especially when it comes to cars and cyber physical systems. Every impact of, let's say, cybersecurity on the car have real uh, Im impact and also safety related consequences to the users. So that's definitely a question we don't have yet the answer, but we will definitely uh, have to 
have the right answer to that. Yeah, Thank and you. also to complement on that, what happens actually if the car is in limbo mode and it's you are driving on the highway and actually some of the functionalities of the car are stopped or gradually stopped. So and you are forced actually to to uh, find in the parking spot nearby and you don't know what happened. Somebody else actually takes the action for you. So these kind of uh, questions actually are uh, research oriented and there's still actually no actual answer that is that holds in every scenario yeah and just sorry just one quick also remark there are also laws in countries and regulations that state that a car shouldn't have any decision when it comes to life-threatening events mm -hmm. so you should always as a user be in control of your vehicle so we cannot expect the car to do too much for you when it comes to life-threatening situations yeah. thank you microphone one Yes, so as you stated, cars are, well, um, pretty dangerous things, so uh, at some points you will have to react immediately upon detection, mm -hmm. uh, which is very problematic. Uh, you also stated that CAN is limited to a frame size of 8 bytes, yeah, 8 payload bytes, but for instance the UDS specification has mm -hmm. support for multi-frame messages, which could easily be uh, used internally also. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think that macking would be a far more... Uh, reliable way of preventing these kind of attacks? Um, I think uh, in this sense, uh, actually, again, you need to update, uh, to update it in the, in the sense of, uh, um, uh, so if you have a local network that actually you try to put something in there, some kind of addressing scheme, so I think it's not really good in the sense of, uh, let's say it's restraining, and then you have to fragment the data that you have to send. Because, to be honest, um, actually, uh, uh, the, the car manufacturers in this kind of uh, payload which I showed, they don't encode just one functionality, but they encode four. So, for instance, you can have all the windows inside one frame. So, the state of all the windows. So, it can happen that actually if uh, you encode something in there or you put some other thing scheme there, then actually uh, some critical information cannot be interpreted correctly. And, of course, what happens if I am someone which actually does not care about security and I do uh, diagnostics, which means actually that I really need to interpret this and I don't care about addressing any longer, I just want to interpret the payload itself. That's it. So, uh, what, what, what you say is really valuable if you do it in uh, automotive Ethernet, is really valuable if you do it on Flexray. It doesn't mean that actually this is like a, uh, the best solution, but there actually you have more capabilities on doing things. Uh, but we still have a long way to, to go until Ethernet becomes the standard and uh, to the current actually uh, analysis to be able to extend Ethernet to the, uh, actually be able to capture everything which is there in the con, uh, it will be at least uh, 60 years. So, so basically we should try to get rid of CAN in order to... Yeah, so th this, this, could be, this could be a solution, but, well, you cannot get rid of something which is stable and for many years that easily. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And also thank just you. one thing regarding Mac and encryption. The problem is if you compromise the ECU, all the packet that you're going to send from that ECU will be proper according to uh, the security mechanism you would have in place. So that's also a problem. As soon as the ECU is uh, compromised, whatever comes out of it, it's legit. So that's why we also need more than uh, just Mac and encryption. Okay. Microsoft One. Yeah. Um, continuing on that uh, last remark, uh, why don't you get rid of CAN? Um, obviously because it would be too expensive right now. Mm -hmm. um, what you could consider is that um, because it's a bus, mm -hmm. um, anything that you can invent, um, somebody can inject it to, against you. Definitely, yes, so for sure. I, th I think the only way is to move to a start topology and make mm -hmm. the hub of that, uh, relay mm -hmm. all the CAN messages all over the place so you can mm -hmm. still leverage all your existing equipment. Mm -hmm. but have that central uh, item with a more heavy processor mm -hmm. and do all the decisions for you. Yeah. yeah. But, but of course, that will cost a lot of extra wiring in the car. Yes. And so this is not good because already actually CAN was invented for, for this reason, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to reduce the wiring hardness inside this car. Okay. But now the question is, how much extra wiring do you think 
it will take in a normal car to uh, get back to a start topology? Uh, I guess about uh, uh, 30%. So to my experience, uh, from the time that actually I worked uh, with uh, uh, manufacturers, um, I guess that actually the, the main difficulty there is not to really make the topology. The main difficulty is to be able to calibrate all those units uh, and to, give, to make them in proper state in order to actually do what you want them to do. So the, even, even if the wire, we leave the, uh, the wire actually uh, additional wiring, we leave it aside, then OK, th this comes to, to a question as well. Because, well, you cannot force someone that actually really does simple functionalities in order to calibrate, then it goes to some kind of other topology where he really needs to know everything. And for every unit, let's say, that he needs to calibrate, where actually in, in CAN, you just need to, to uh, know the IDs and the payload that you need to encode, and that's it. So I guess, well, I mean, I understand that this is like a, this is like in scope, but there are a lot of considerations. I mean, we can go there, but let's say it require it has some risk. So, I mean, to my perspective, as I as I see it, also in most you have a risk. So, because most is a ring topology already. So, yeah. But I, I think also one key consideration to take into account when it comes to start topology, there has been some work pro proposing, like let's say what they call a master ECU, and they relay basically every connection, or every communication from one ECU to another via such a master ECU. And there also have been work proposing like, hey, we could also harden this. We can also have you know, some TPM um, or the trusted platform model on the chip, we can also use this one in order, in order to hand over certificates or keys to the ECUs. But the problem is always the same thing. You had something that could be eventually compromised. So as soon as this is comp compromised, what do you do? And plus, there is also the, pr the real-time uh, problem. The, the, as a constraint, you need to guarantee that every message are delivered uh, as soon as possible. So if you would relay everything through uh, a central unit and having some processing there, you might also impede the real-time uh, ca capabilities of, of the bus. So that's why also, yeah, having a start topology might be a bit trickier than uh, what we expect. Does that answer the, the question? <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, we can discuss it offline. We are yeah, still uh, outside, yeah. so don't hesitate uh, to, yeah. uh, to come and uh, discuss further. We'll be more than happy to, to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Yeah.